this is our kind of revision um, screencast. So I'm just going to go through some of the questions that have been asked and maybe the topics that you probably want to revise a bit more. So however I ended up doing that, um, I asked you a bunch of questions via Socrative, uh, whether you knew them very well or you had no idea or you thought you were a bit um, unsure about them. So what I've done is ranked all those scores and given them a score. So the higher this value, the less you seem to know about it. So things like this, you can describe how temperature affects rate. Everyone said that they could do that just perfectly fine. Fantastic. Uh, uh, everything that's a little bit higher, I'm going to go through. Uh, so I'm selecting basically anything that's called higher than 10. Uh, on the bright side, though, uh, if you all answered that you didn't understand any of it, uh, this would add up to about 1500. Um, as it stands, it only adds up to 136. So uh, you're actually 99% of the way, well, 90%-ish the way there. So that's not bad. Uh, so the topics I'm going to cover are these. Uh, and hopefully, which direction would they be going? They'll be here. Um, I'm going to stick those YouTube annotations on those. So if you want to just skip to one of these things, uh, you can click on those. And then if you want, click the back to start one there. So that should stay up there. Um, so it's going to be a screencast. You can navigate around if you're using YouTube, um, which is quite nice. Uh, also, I'm going to probably focus on these three a bit more because uh, this is these are the only three where more people said you really weren't sure uh, next to I could do this with some revision. So there's going to be a little bit more on those. Um, anyway, I'm going to go through them in order now. Uh, you don't need to take it with or in order, of course. Uh, those annotations are there if you want to click through. Um, at least they should work, uh, and hopefully they do. Anyway, so on with it. First, pseudo first order approximation. Uh, so a couple of people have a few issues about how to apply this or when to apply it. Um, it's certainly a bit of a weird thing to come across the first time you find it. Uh, and the basics of this. In a second order reaction, that is our rate law. It's proportional to two concentrations. Um, but we can simplify this down if, oh, sorry, that case should not be there, um, to just a first order reaction. But this is only true when one of the reagents is in excess, so in this case B. One is in excess, uh, its concentration doesn't change. If this was, say, 5 moles and A was 0 0.1 moles, for instance, uh, well, let's just actually write it down. Uh, if the starting concentration of B is 5 moles uh, and A is on the order of 0 0.1 moles, then the end concentration of this would be zero and 4.9 okay that means as far as we're concerned that is pretty much stayed constant um which is fine uh so that means we can simplify things down to here where this k obs the observed rate constant is equal to k times concentration of b uh, so that tells us that you know if we were to do this reaction and we plotted log a versus t uh, we get a straight line um a couple of caveats to this uh, B will decrease towards the end of interaction, so we might actually start to see a little bit of a curve. So if you did your reaction, this is the T and this is log of A, you might start seeing things go down and then they'll curve. They'll go away from uh, linearity. Uh, so in that case, it would be perfectly possible to get rid of those data points and just plot a straight line through there. Great, and that gets you K. That is your rate constant, or at least k observed. And you can feed that back into this equation to get your real rate constant, because presumably you know what b is. Um, if it averages out to whatever your starting concentration is. So mostly you want to use it to simplify some of your reactions, and you only use it when one is in quite a bit of excess. Um, so it's just a little bit of a mathematical trick, and it just happens to work out experimentally. It's, it's, it's a pretty nice approximation. So this is Arrhenius equation and simple collision theory. So we've come across the Arrhenius equation before. Uh, it's the one that tells us that the rate constant is basically a function of temperature. The rate constant changes according to temperature, but there are a few things that fit into it. Uh, and so how do we relate that to what we can pick up from simple collision theory? 
So this should be very straightforward. Simple collision theory tells us that uh, molecules must collide, but not only must they collide, they must collide in the right orientation and with the right energy. So that means for every collision we have, uh, there we've got to modify that a little bit. So Z0 here is the collision rate, and that's the collision rate independent of any concentration. So we had the whole ZAB um, thing. That was the cross section times the speed uh, times by the density. So if we ignore the density for a moment, that is Z0, that is the rate of collisions. It's a theoretical rate constant as well. Um, so if all collisions were successful, the reaction would proceed with Z0 equals K. So that's a interesting fact to remember. It is a theoretical rate constant. Unfortunately, that theory that all collisions uh, react doesn't hold true. Okay, it's not brilliant theory. Uh, so we need to modify it through a few things, namely energy. Uh, do they literally have the right energy to react? If they don't, um, that's kind of independent of the molecule speed, although it is related. Um, if they have the right energy, they react. And if they have the right orientation, they react. So remember, if you have a big long chain molecule uh, with a functional group at one end and a long carbon chain at the other, you know, if a collision happens over there, it's not going to react. So you need to have a right uh, orientation and the right position. So we have this steric factor here. So that brings us back to the A in the Arrhenius expression. You should be able to see that these are very, very similar. So when I'm asking you to relate the Arrhenius expression and simple collision theory, this is what we're asking you to spot the connection between. There's a pre-exponential factor and then exponential term. And notice that these are very, very similar in form and that's no accident. It basically says that a, our pre-expansion factor in the Arrhenius equation that we can get from data is equal to this collision rate times the steric factor, because these two are related. Uh, so in other words, it basically means the number of successfully orientated collisions. So that's great. Uh, and we also have this other factor here. And the important thing to realize is that that uses the Boltzmann constant. Uh, so this is talking about individual molecules. This simple collision theory assumes that we're only looking at the molecules. The Arrhenius expression, that's derived empirically. We're working with huge quantities of molecules, so we use the gas constant. That's all in per mole. This is in per molecule. Or molecule. Oops. <laughs> anyway. That's what we need when we want to connect these two together. Notice the equations are very similar, and then <clears throat> see what the term that ship has. Uh, okay, so experimental methods. Uh, I think if more people clicked that they weren't quite sure about this one, probably because we didn't spend much time in the lectures doing it. Um, uh, that's sort of intentional. There's a lot of derivations. Uh, that are part of the course that I've shipped onto the screencasts. They are worth going through. You are expected to know them, um, or at least you are expected to be able to follow those manipulations quite well. You'll not be expected to memorize them, for instance, but you do need to follow them. So go through those um, screencasts and follow the derivations at some point in the revision period, probably. Uh, but here's just a quick way of going through it. I'm going to recap them. Uh, you've got to think of the properties of your reaction and link them to the properties of the method you want to follow them with. Uh, so let's just go through these uh, in-situ reactions, uh, or these in-situ methods, sorry. Uh, first of all, UV vis. Okay, that's an excitation of electrons. You'd be very used to that from the labs. That's where you usually get really broad peaks that look like this. And that's your wavelength, usually in nanometers, and then absorbance. Um, now, you require for that to really work nicely, the molecule should be absorbing light. Um, things like transition metal compounds, really, really good for that. They have really strong charge transfer bands or DD transitions, depending on how deep you've gone into inorganic chemistry so far. Um, but they're also really good for organic reactions. So look at these molecules. These are dyes. Uh, I think specifically these are hair dyes. Um, and look at all these alternating double bonds everywhere. Little in pairs that can 
done it. So that is one whole huge conjugated system. Uh, similar here, I think that's an azo dye with that group in the middle. All conjugated, all conjugated. All of these alternating double bonds that are really extensive are a good indication that your molecule has a massively good chance of absorbing light. They're called chromophores. Uh, they absorb light very, very effectively. Um, so if you've got a molecule that looks like that, massive conjugated system, UV, it will be easily detectable by UV. And sometimes if you react it, you're going to break that chromophore uh, up so that it no longer absorbs light. So a lot of reactions involving dyes have a tendency to break that chromophore. Um, really obvious ones being the crystal violet and crystal green type solutions. You have this double bond here with a with phenyl rings, I'm drawing it terribly here. Uh, and if you add OH to this double bond here, you would break that in half and then it goes colorless. So a lot of um, dyes reactions like that were really good to follow with UV. Um, infrared, uh, this excites with vibrations, so you should be very familiar with that. You Obviously OH bands are really visible, CH ones are uh, quite typical. Very characteristic are CO bands as well. Uh, so if your reaction gets rid of one of those or produces one of those, infrared is a good bet to use. Uh, so you probably couldn't see, uh, seen in organic chemistry so far, nucleophilic substitution reactions like this or nucleophilic addition reactions, that's very easily detectable by infrared. It's a completely different functional group here. So if you have that huge change in functional group infrared, it's a really quick, fast method. Uh, so as the um, peak according, uh, peak that corresponds to that bond disappears, that's your reaction. Uh, and NMR, yeah, this is another kind of fallback, um, which is really good for following kinetics, providing they are slow. Uh, and NMR scan takes at least a minute to do. So that's one minute per data point, And you want 10 or 15 data points to get a decent trace. So if your reaction take is faster than about 15 minutes, don't bother. Um, but you don't need to necessarily have a UV active molecule. You don't necessarily need to have a major change in functional group. Uh, you can really follow almost anything by NMR. Anything with hydrogen or with a, any NMR active isotope in it, you can follow with it. Um, again, slow, but if, if you've got the material there and you can see it and you can get time on the spectrometer for long enough, it's a really good bet to use. All right, so the other in situ methods. So these are the ones that the screencasts have a lot of derivations with. So I've only briefly covered them in the actual face-to-face -face lectures. Uh, conductivity and pressure. Uh, now these are useful because conductivity is proportional to concentration, uh, or at least um, or at least once you've taken into account the final and initial conductivity. The equation is slightly complicated, but I'm not going to go over it this time. Uh, pressure, um, well, number of PV equals NRT. So, you know, your pressure is directly proportional to the number of moles. Uh, so therefore directly proportional to concentration. So you can use pressure directly. Um, so if your reaction produces ions, now things can eliminate CL, well, I've got them here, haven't I? Um, they eliminate or consume things like this if they are changing their charges at some point. Um, conductivity is good. Uh, unfortunately, conductivity is proportional to the total ion concentration. So it's if you have H plus and CL being liberated, that is what's proportional to the conductivity. Kappa, but I can't quite handwrite what that would be compared to um, a K. Anyway, so you would have to take into account the fact that that might be twice the concentration of your actual product. Um, so you produce one product and one of these each, you then have to divide your conductivity in half. Uh, so that's the one that's worth paying attention to. Uh, pressure, in other words, is on the other hand, is pretty much direction, directly proportional to the number of moles. A little bit of convoluted mass to get there, but it's, you know, the, the punchline is pretty decent. Uh, so if your, um, 
if your reaction produces gas or it consumes gas, follow it by pressure. Really, really useful. Uh, and then there's ones for fast reactions. So all of those pre previous ones need to be done on a lab time scale where you've got time to fiddle about with things and take readings. Uh, usually reactions tend to happen a bit faster than that. Usually a couple of seconds and they're done, or even milliseconds and they're done. Uh, and that's where you use flow methods and flash photolysis. So flow methods, if your reactions are over in a couple of seconds, you can go back and use those. Again, I'm not going to describe those again. You can look those up in a textbook. What are the flow methods? You've got uh, continuous flow and stopped flow. Uh, do just shove those into a search engine if you're wanting to find out more about them. Uh, and flash photolysis is the one for reactions that are really fast. You can spot intermediates through flash photolysis because you are initiating the reaction with a pulse of light uh, and then you are seeing what changes there are on a nanosecond time scale. Down to that kind of level you can do quite reasonably um, because you know very precisely when the reaction starts because you've flashed it with a, uh, a UV initiation. It does require a photochemical reaction to initiate, unfortunately, so if your reaction is just thermal, you can't quite use that method. Um, but usually a good pulse of light will set off most reactions and you can follow them through kinetics that way. Uh, so uh, this is not canonical, this is just the kind of questions you will want to ask yourself. So does it react over several minutes? Well, no, if it's really quick, how quick? If it's almost instant flash photolysis, that's a good bet that's there for you. Uh, if it reacts just over a couple of seconds, maybe stop flow is what you want. But if it reacts quite slowly, have a look what changes are there. Does the functional group change? Yes. Infrared. Great. There's usually good, pretty clear change in the infrared. Um, does absorbance change? That's specifically UV. There's absorbance. So yes, use UV to follow it. Uh, does it produce or consume ions? Do it for conductivity. Does it produce or cons consume gas? Press, uh, develop it by pr uh, follow it by pressure. Uh, and if your answer is no to all of those, you might need to just go back to non-in situ methods and quench the reaction and follow it through something else. Usually reacting it into something that you can detect. Um, but you know you will need some time to do that so go back over the quenching if you want to understand that but this is the kind of the idea of what your thought process should look at it's not so much something that you need to memorize this flow chart this is just the process of what you should be thinking about what are the properties of the reaction do they match up with the method i want to use to follow it um, if it happens if your reaction is over and done within two seconds, don't use magnetic resonance to follow it because you need at least a minute for a data point. Uh, if the number of molecules on the left and the right are the same, the pressure isn't going to change, so you can't follow it by pressure or volume changes. Okay, there's that kind of um, thinking. So you don't want to get confused or anything like that. So, right, so integrated rate laws. Um, I've thrown up another few videos on Canvas about this, so I don't want to spend too long on it. Uh, so I'm just going to give the general method for how you want to go about doing this. So um, if I remember, I'm going to stick one of those annotations there, so you should be able to click that and go to, to that video. Um, it covers the second order integrated rate law. Um, so in general, what you need to do is take your rate law. It's going to be changing concentration over time is equal to K times some kind of concentration. Uh, and then you want to rearrange that. So that dA by dt equals k. We can bring that dt to the other side. And that means we are integrating one side with respect to a and the other side with respect to t. Okay. That is how we figure out what we want to integrate. We integrate one side with respect to the concentration and the other side with respect to time. Doesn't get us much useful information that alone. So we want to use the definite integral. 0 and t, 0 and t. Um, some people will very explicitly say that we are actually going to do this between a0 and at. Both of the 
you know, valid enough, really. So you want to label the concentration as um, time t and at the initial concentration at time zero. Uh, and you, when you do the definite integral for kt, we'll put the k there, you'll get kt minus k zero. Okay, that cancels out. So most of these integrated rate laws end up with kt on the right. Uh, what happens on the left is a little bit mm, changes depending on what it is. Uh, so I've found a couple of derivations for when you've got um, kab and also k a cubed. I've stuck those up on canvas, but these are not ones that you need to worry about. Um, those are kind of very much extension if you want to follow the maths involved with it. You're only expected to really know the first and second order one. Uh, so this is them. So the first order one, that, well, when you rearrange that, you end up with one over A, and you want to integrate that with respect to A, the concentration. Well, that's your special case where you end up with log. Uh, now that log A produces a linear graph, if we want to get what a is equal to, we need e to the power of something. So that's what we got here. So both versions of the integrated rate law, one is linear, one actually predicts the concentration. Uh, and this is why when you plot log of your concentration versus time, you get a straight line with a gradient of k. So let's just leave that up there for a moment. Right, uh, the second order reaction, when you rearrange that, you're going to get 1 over a squared dA, or if you want to um, put it a different way, a to the minus 2 dA. Uh, so the things that you might want to spot with that is make sure your minuses work out. Um, because if you integrate this, you should get a to the minus 1, but then you divide by minus 1, so that should end up this kind of form. So you need to check that your minuses are right, and so that depends whether you've put a minus there or not. Uh, and this two as well comes depending on whether you use rate equals one over two dA by dt. So things get a little bit more complicated here that you might need to be aware of. Um, so depending on where you look, you will find slightly different versions of this formula. Uh, so you just need to be very careful about how you define the rate in the first place. If you want to define it as this half dA by dt, you'll find this too in it. If you use um, B, the product dt is equal to K of the reactant squared, you'll get a positive instead of a minus at this point. Um, so a few things start changing. They're not always a straight, that's the most straightforward version. Doesn't look it because you have to use logs and exponentials, but uh, there is usually only one version of that. The rest start taking multiple versions depending on what you define things as. So you need to be able to take into account that. Um, it should be straightforward. They're all equally valid as long as you're um, consistent, basically. All right, so thermodynamics and equilibrium kinetics. So yeah, we cover kind of a long convoluted derivation about this. Uh, but I think it's a lot simpler than you might think. Though. So the, the derivation was quite complex, but you don't need to know that uh, as such. Uh, you should be aware of it and you should be able to follow the maths, but you won't be expected to regurgitate it in an exam. Um, because regurgitating a long derivation like that is a bit pointless, to, to be fair. Uh, but you do, are expected to know the punchline to it. So, and the, well, the basics of it. So where do we start? Well, let's have a look at the irreversible case. dA by dt is equal to minus ka. That's first order kinetics. Uh, but in a reversible reaction, there are two processes that create that, um, that alter the um, concentration form. So if we have A goes to B or goes back again, we have potentially two rate laws. We have this dA by dt is equal to minus k. A, yeah, that's just what we expect. But we also have the reverse reaction. K by dt equal to positive K. Um, so that would be K going forward. 
and that's k going backwards and make sure that you keep these rate constants um, labeled properly. So really this is your gentle introduction to complex reactions where you get more than one rate constant um, and <clears throat> your concentration of a product or reactant might depend on more than one factor. So we've got a forward and a backward reaction and we combine those by adding them together and you get this. Uh, now the only major thing apart from that that you need to know about equilibria is what happens at equilibrium well your concentrations aren't changing so if your concentrations aren't changing we can do that we can set it to zero uh, and that lets us do this little rearrangement here so if those are equal to zero they must be equal to each other so that's the main leap of logic that you need to be able to make so that is the first introduction to kind of complex reactions as well um, so I've added another video on complex reactions that builds it up from this going through so do watch that one as well uh, so this is the main leap of logic so this is also your introduction to how to do the complex ones uh, the other final punchline is you need to know this diagram so we did a long convoluted derivation that proved this um, the difference between the activation energies is equal to delta h of the reaction pretty much this should be intuitive to you if you've seen this diagram you know that this value here is equilibria big k uh, this value here these values is kinetics little k or at least okay, that's one k one there um, so this is the punchline of thermodynamics and equilibrium kinetics once you this is all the derivation that you might need to know. This is the punchline to it. Uh, and that's really what you're expected to know. Uh, you should be able to follow the maths, but you don't necessarily need to regurgitate it in an exam. It's very useful if you can follow it because you might be asked to follow far more complicated stuff in the future. Uh, <clears throat> and certainly if you get used to manipulating numbers, um, it's definitely a massive benefit to you. All right, so the steady state approximation, uh, this is the next jump into kind of complex reactions. So the steady state approximation does have a few similarities with equilibrium. Namely, we're setting certain rates to zero and using that to get new information out of it. So what is the steady state approximation? Well, we have a two-step reaction. A goes to B goes to C. And, well, it's very similar in many respects to the equilibrium because, well, the concentration of this depends on two rate constants. So we have K1 first and K2 second. Uh, <clears throat> and that means we've got two factors controlling the rate of change of the intermediate. So the steady state approximation says that rate does not change. It also says that the um, concentration of B overall is roughly zero um, but that's possibly less useful to you than knowing that the rate doesn't change very much so if this is all equal to zero then k1 8 is equal to k2b that means we can straight up substitute that for this and get us that final equation so that is the steady state approximation it just basically says the concentration of the intermediates doesn't change so the production of that final product is basically first order kinetics with respect to A. That is the steady state approximation. There is very little to it. Uh, <coughs> it's one of the things that's very useful to us um, as an approximation. It kind of does break down in reality, but it's very useful for certain things that are fast. So when would this apply? Um, a goes to B goes to C. Well, why would the concentration of this be very um, constant <coughs> or very low? Uh, well, obviously, if it appears and then reacts instantly, and this reaction was very fast, then we're not going to see much change in the concentration of B. Because as soon as it's formed, it's a negligible concentration, but it reacts again. <coughs> so, if this is a low figure here and this is really the other one's really fast we can apply the steady state approximation uh, if it's the other way around we can't apply it if k1 was 
actually quite fast, then B would have time. <coughs> if this was high and this was low, then B would have a chance to accumulate. It wouldn't be reacting as soon as it appears. So we wouldn't be able to say that this concentration doesn't change. We'd have to use a slightly more complicated approach to figuring out um, <coughs> the rate of formation of C. Um, <coughs> now, manipulation rate laws and equations. I think this may just throw some people because you wouldn't quite know what does it mean. Um, and unfortunately, the short answer is it doesn't really mean one individual procedure. If you want to learn how to manipulate rate laws and do complicated reactions, there is no one size fits all approach to this. You have got to be able to use a couple of tricks and solve some problems. Uh, so I'm going to go through some of them now as like examples um, of how you would approach it, but they're not going to be completely worked out. I'm going to give you the tricks for what you need to do. And now from an exam perspective, it's going to depend entirely what you're asked. They're going to, it's going to depend on what the set of reaction conditions are and what you then ask to calculate from it. So there should be enough hints thrown into the exams to guide you through this. You're not expected to do something really crazy and convoluted and it'll just say, do this 15 marks. You're not going to be asked to do that. It'll be broken up. Um, <clears throat> so this is all really about learning if a skill in manipulating equations. Uh, what do you want to, uh, what tricks can you use? So let's just have a look at this one, for instance. Uh, we're going to do two step rea two reactions. So this is similar to our two step reaction that we applied the steady state approximation to. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I clearly have not checked that slide over. Uh, so here's a multi step reaction. We've got number one, we've got number two. So now, what information can we get? Um, well, what's the rate of change of A, that starting material? Uh, well, that is minus K A B rate. What is the rate of change of our final product? DT. Uh, well, that is also a one step reaction. It's called K1, K minus one, K2. Uh, so that is K2 C B. So this is probably where we're going to start with. So you need to be used to building these rate laws up. Um, well, I've missed one actually, because A is reformed by K minus one concentration of C. Uh, so now what do we want to assume? Well, we can take various assumptions. What we can assume is say, DC by DT equals zero. Great, so that's like the steady state approximation. So if DC by TC, that would be equal to, well, it's going to be a bit more complicated. So we're going to do K1 um, A B. That's the formation of it. Oops, let's go back. Um, minus, because it's been removed. K minus one, concentration of C. Uh, and then C, well, it will be disappearing again. So that's K2. See. So we can start manipulating that because we now know it's equal to zero and say <coughs> uh, various things. For instance, we can say K1AB is equal to K minus one C minus K2 C. We can take those C's out. Ooh, this gets a little bit convoluted. K minus one minus K2 K1. A, B, oh, I've missed something here, that should be B, B should be in there, uh, and then we can rearrange, so we can say that the concentration of C is equal to K1, A, B, that, and over K minus 1 minus K2, B. This is just kind of Picking that forward. There we go. Uh, this is just kind of an example of the manipulations you have to do. Um, again, it, exam perspective, it depends on what question you ask. So if I 
was to give you this reaction and then say, tell me an expression for the concentration of C, this is how you would do it. Uh, you would assume that its rate of change doesn't change, so you can work it out. Uh, alternatively, we could start with a completely different uh, assumption. I think I've deleted the wrong, scrubbed out the wrong thing. We could use another assumption, for instance. We could uh, assume that that is A and B and C, they're all at equilibrium, in which case the concentration of A, B and C don't change. Um, to be honest, that would be less um, sensible because A is obviously reacting to D. Uh, we could notice that um, C is intermediate, so it doesn't change and so on. Uh, we could also ask what's actually the rate of change of B? Well, two Bs get consumed at this point, so A plus two B equals C, so we'd be wanting to define the rate of reaction as minus dA by dt uh, minus a half dB by dt equals to d, or positive dC by dt. All of this sort of thing uh, could be asked. So there, like I said, there is not a one size fits all. It's just a case of looking at the reactions and then what's being asked of you. So let's just go through another version here. Um, <clears throat> so this is something like a kind of a weird complex reaction. A plus B goes to, they combine to form AB, then this hits B, uh, and then you get B2. So this actually, if you look at what's happening here, those sort of cancel. So what's actually happening as an overall reaction is B, or 2B is going to B2. Uh, and then A, B is an intermediate, A is like a catalyst. So a catalyst coming together to associate with something and then dissociating. This is kind of a typical reaction. So we can work out some other things to do with this. Uh, the rate, um, V over dt is one over half, minus that, plus two by dt. Okay, that's the sort of information that could be asked. Uh, we could also assume that dA, that one, uh, dAB by dt is equal to something. How would we work that out? Um, <clears throat> we can also say that dA by dt, because that is being produced and consumed at the same point, that is equal to zero. Oh, so what does that now? But that's a chink in the armour that we can actually go in and look at this reaction and start manipulating numbers. So let's say, what, what is that equal to? So dA by dt, well, that is, it's removed via a second order reaction. It's K1 AB, it's added back again. By a think backwards reaction, and that's just dependent on the concentration of AB, uh, and it's also generated again by a K2, and that's AB. B. Right, so that's something. So we can actually say that that's all equal to zero, uh, and we could even say that. The rate of change of that's zero because it's a steady state approximation. So <clears throat> we can start applying things to this. Uh, we could say that if the steady state approximation says that's zero and that the concentration of it should be roughly equal to zero, we can look at this equation and cancel out that because that should be about zero and that's zero. So what we can actually see is that the rate uh, of change of that it's in fact going to be yeah, minus K1A B, which, yeah, <clears throat> which should be equal to zero and so on. So we can say things about the concentration changes uh, <clears throat> and so on. Anyway, anyway, this is all about trial and error to see what you can come up with, and it depends kind of on what you've been asked. So the various Things can get quite complicated, sure, um, but it's kind of a little bit about creativity, reading the question and learning some tricks. So 
the main tricks you need to think about allow me to go through here is that your intermediates look at the intermediates uh, their rate of change should be zero we could tell you to do that and see what you can get from it um, catalysts their change should be okay in this case that should be equal to zero as well so in this case that concentration of AA doesn't change and so on and you also might want to ask uh, what happens to all of these equations <clears throat> when certain rate of constants are higher than the others so we might say that this is a multi-step reaction what happens when k2 is very very much greater than k1 k minus 1 what happens with that? What happens to the equations? What happens if K2 is in fact much, much smaller than K1 <coughs> or K minus 1? <coughs> what happens when K1 is very, very much greater than K minus 1? Well, then it's probably not reasonable to call it an equilibrium, is it? So um, you can be asking that kind of thing. So this, again, this is the more advanced end of what you could be asked in an exam or any kind of kinetics question whatsoever. Uh, it requires a bit of creativity. It just requires manipulating the equations around. Uh, and to be honest, don't panic about getting a completely right answer. Usually, if you're given an exact typical exam question, we'll actually tell you to justify a rate that just says it's k obs of a over b or something like that. And once you get to a convoluted set of rate constants multiplied by by that you're done. The rest is just ooh, encountering anyway. Uh, anyway, that is it uh, for this revision lecture. I'm sure we'll be plenty more questions about this last topic in general. Uh, there's just unfortunately very few ways of approaching it. It's all about manipulating things to try and solve some problems. Um, so anyway, that's it for. Ooh, yeah, I should get rid of that whole steady state thing. Maybe I could re-record this with some better slides, I don't know. <laughs>